Hi, sixth grade teachers. My name is Kelly, and today I'm going to walk you through the early civilizations of the Americas unit plan. This is the ninth unit of the year and follows the Greece and Rome unit. It has six lessons and takes eight to 10 days to complete. In this lesson, we're focusing on how innovation impacts a civilization. Students are going to learn about the Mississippian Mound Building Society, the Maya, the Aztec, and the Inca societies. Students will learn about the Maya, Inca, and Aztecs again in eighth grade, so this unit is meant to be more of an introduction to the societies, focusing on the innovations. We will focus on the system of writing used by the Maya, how the Aztecs changed their environment to meet their needs, and how the Inca used roads and bridges to connect their empire. There's a unit question map that outlines the structure of the unit. There's also a unit slideshow to be used as you move through the unit. There are a few of these special notes, bolded and highlighted in yellow as you move through the unit. This first one is about the spelling of the word Inca. We typically spell it with a C, but if we are being more true to the culture, we will use a K. The compelling question for this unit is, how can innovation impact a civilization? We have four supporting questions. What innovations were most important to the Mississippian mound builders? How did writing impact the Maya? How did the Aztecs change their environment to meet their needs? and why were roads and bridges helpful to the Incas. Lesson one is titled Innovation and is set to take one day. In this lesson, we're focusing on the meaning of innovation and the geographic characteristics of where the four civilizations were located. Students then compare that to Iowa's geography. Begin this lesson by displaying this map and explaining that these represent the civilizations we have looked at so far. So we have Rome, Greece, Mesopotamia, ancient India, ancient China, Egypt, and Western Africa. Then we talk over the compelling question and use the Freyer model to define the word innovation. Then you move on and explain that we're going to take a look at four more civilizations from an area of the world that we haven't really explored yet, which would be North and South America. Students will work through this map and another map that reflects more of North America to label the different geographic features. The cell finishes off by comparing it back to Iowa's geography, which students might still have access to this from the very first unit. Lesson two, Early Civilizations of the Americas, is set to take two to three days. In this, we're taking a look at the Mississippian Mound Building Society and the Maya, Aztec, and Inca civilizations. Then we do comparisons of the four. Start by reviewing the compelling question, then work through learning about the Mississippian Mound Building Society. There are some maps on slide 12 and then various resources that you can access through Britannica School that will help students find out more information about the Mississippian culture. Students will add the information they find to this grapes chart on page four of their student packet. For the next section, which can take one to two days to complete, students are going to learn about the Mayas, Aztec, and Inca and finish off that grapes chart. There's some topics such as sacrifices that should probably be skipped over. And there's also a few options for the ways you can move through this. You can divide students into group and assign each a letter to research for each civilization. So you could have a G group, an R, an A, etc. You could also divide students into groups and assign each a civilization to research. So you'd have the Inca group, the Maya group, and the Aztec group. Or you could work through each civilization as a whole class, bouncing in between partner and individual research to share out with whole group. The next step is to make comparisons. The first thing to consider is why there is less information on the Mississippian Mound Builders compared to the Maya, Aztec, and Incas. And there are several options. Most of it would come from the record keeping of the civilizations themselves and from the Europeans who encountered them. Guide students to compare and contrast the four civilizations on page five of their student packet. Lesson three is titled Achievements as to take one day to complete. So in this lesson, we're focusing on how innovations impacted the Mississippian mound builders and the Maya. Most of the time is spent on an activity learning about the Mayan system of writing. The first five to 10 minutes are spent generating a list of achievements of the Mississippian mound builders, and then having students think about which achievement they believe to be the most important and to give at least one supporting reason. Then we move into learning about the writing style of the Maya. There is an article to read that does a great job explaining how the system works. Then there is an activity that students can do to learn how to write their name in Maya glyphs. The writing system of the Maya is similar to the hieroglyphics used in Egypt, except that with this one, it's focused on syllables and combinations of letters. So the way this activity works, students first have to split their name into Maya syllables. So in this case, there's an example of Anna, and it was split into A and N-A. 
if the syllable doesn't end with a vowel, you have to add a silent vowel. Adam has an extra vowel at the end. Antonio has an extra vowel in the middle. Whatever vowel was right in front of it is the one that you use. Then students would look at the Maya glyphs chart to find the syllables for their name. The top row are the pure vowels. So for Anna, the first A would come from here. The rest of the chart gives you the starting consonant typically, and then each column represents one of the vowels. So for Anna, after we pick our symbol for the first A, then we go and we find our N, and we need an NA, so we can use any of these. Then students take a screenshot of their glyphs and add it to the final slide. Many of these have more than one option in the box. Students just pick which one they prefer. And if students don't see the letter, there is a substitution doc that explains what to do. Students have to line up their syllables into the glyph block. So if it's a two-syllable, they can use this one, this one, or this one. The glyphs might have to be rotated or sized down to make them fit. There is a resource here for teachers to use if you are stuck on how to help students with the Maya writing activity. Lesson four is called the Aztecs and their environment and is set to take one day. In this lesson, students are taking a look at how aqueducts and chinampas were used in the Aztec civilization. Begin this lesson with taking a look at various images and figuring out if this is an ideal environment for agriculture. This first one here of a cornfield would be yes, and if it's yes, what makes it ideal? Well, clearly it's a land with good soil. It looks like it has decent weather, et cetera, et cetera. This next one is a desert, so no, and it's not ideal because there's a lack of water and lack of quality soil for growing items. This one here could be a maybe. It looks like some of it you might be able to grow some things or certain types of crops that might be successful in the water. This one would be, again, a maybe. It looks like there's decent growing capable, but the ground makes it difficult. So the terrace farming needed to happen in order to make it more successful. There are a couple of others to look over to talk about, including one with mostly water as its resource. This is one of the salt areas where they pull salt from the water. Students will look at this painting of the Aztec capital and its causeways, which were roads to get to and from the capital across the lake, as well as this map showing how it was put together, again with the causeways. This will help you prompt students into thinking about whether or not it was an ideal location. That lake is filled with brackish water or salty water, and salt water isn't good to drink. You can't really use it for cooking or washing, and eventually the population in that capital city grew too high and it couldn't be supported with that water supply anyway. So we had to figure out how the Aztecs could get enough water to support their population. There is a video that can be watched called How Did the Aztecs Get Their Water? that talks about aqueducts. You'll want to stop it around 2 minutes and 10 seconds because from that point it moves on to something else and isn't really helpful. The speaker does start by describing a Roman-style aqueduct, so you can make a connection from the Greece and Rome unit before talking about the early Aztec styles of aqueducts. Then we have a drawing of what the Chapultepec aqueduct probably looked like. And in this, you can see two lines, which are the waterways. One waterway would be running with water while the other one was getting cleaned. And then they would switch this. And this allowed for good water to be consistently available to the people in the city. Up next, students learn about chinampas, which are floating gardens. There is a floating gardens article and worksheet to use, or you could simply watch the video. Now, the video is 17 minutes in length, and while a lot of it has good information, you do not need to see the whole thing. There are some parts that you can jump around and skip. What is cool about the video is that you actually see them starting to build what a chinampa looks like. That information is also available in the worksheet, which might be easier for some students to access. Use whatever works best for you and your students. Students. Lesson five is entitled The Great Inca Road. It takes one to two days to complete. In this lesson, students are taking a look at the road and considering its purpose and level of innovation. Students are going to look at how the Inca worked with their environment when developing their road system and their bridges. Kick off the lesson by reviewing the compelling question and thinking about innovation in terms of road systems. So have the students look at this map of U.S. highways and interstates. They might notice that it's very crowded on the East Coast, more open in the West. They might notice that a lot of it seems to be mostly up and down, north, south, or east, west. Then take a look at the Iowa map. Again, the interstates are very much north, south, east, west. And then there is a map to the side here of the road system that was part of the Inca Empire. Students might want to make a comparison between the two of what they see. So then we look over supporting question four, and there is a video that can be watched that provides some basic information about the Great Inca Road. 
there's a section of their student packet that has fill in the blank spots that goes along with this video. Then we move into impressions of the road and we look at lithographs to figure out who used the road and why. This comes from the American Indian Smithsonian Museum, or you can use the slides right in the slideshow. In these lithographs, we get some new vocabulary terms as related to the bridge builders and those who travel along the road to pass messages. Up next is a gallery of the different types of bridges used in the Incan Empire. And the last few are of suspension bridges made out of different types of grass. There's also a video to watch about how that bridge is woven. And there are some questions that go along with the two concerning the importance of bridges in the Incan Empire. The next activities are optional, but do help the students better understand how those bridges work. The first one is exploring tension and compression. So students push against each other or pull against each other. The push is more of the Roman type of bridge and the pull is more of the suspension bridge. There's also an activity where students can be a bridge maker. So you'll need some cardboard, a couple of chairs, and eventually some rope to help imitate the creation of a suspension bridge. Lesson six is the summative, and students are answering the compelling question by claiming which of the four civilizations were the most innovative. Because we're asking students to decide between the four, we want to keep in mind that some students might have some ancestry linked to one of these civilizations. Because of that, we're going to want to keep the summatives just between you and the student and not share the finished summative with peers. So the summative is the most innovative civilization of the early Americas award. And students are going to fill out an application to nominate their chosen civilization to win this award. So the qualifications are that the civilization must be one of the four learned about in the unit. It has to be one that the student believes to be the most innovative out of the four. And then applications must include background information, three examples of innovation along with an explanation as to why they were innovations an explanation of how the innovations impacted the civilization. This one right here is the compelling question. And an explanation of why this civilization was more innovative than the other three civilizations in the unit. At the end, just to make it look more official, it says applications are due by. So you can just fill in the blank on that one. To make it a little bit easier, there is a template that you can share with students. Students put in the name of the civilization they chose and add their name in the bottom. The other slides are simply placeholders for the required information in the project. Students might want to change up the background of the slides, add pictures, etc. to make it a more creative version of the application. I hope this video was helpful as you prepare to teach the early civilizations of the Americas unit. As always, please reach out to your PLC leader, instructional coach, or curriculum facilitator if you have any questions or are in need of any additional support.